So uh, please welcome Jack Gibson. He's going to talk about Cupid. <coughs> so uh, this is the third Cupid AMQP presentation of the day. So I'm going to try not to overlap with uh, everything else everybody else has talked about. Instead of talk about actually what we built versus vendor speak. So <laughs> try to get past that a bit. <laughs> so, um, so I'm Jack Gibson. I'm from PayPal. Um, we are in the process of rolling out AMQP and Cupid in particular to a large portion of our infrastructure. And we'll talk about a little bit about what we found and some of the, the lessons learned through our implementation. And then hopefully open up for questions as you guys go through it. So a little bit of background about PayPal and I'll talk about why we're actually looking at Cupid and what we're doing there. Um, so we handle actually 60% of all web transactions that involve money worldwide. Um, so it's a pretty significant number. We actually handle more monetary transactions than Google and Yahoo combined. Um, so we actually have one of the largest Oracle instances in the world. So when you think about databases, our databases are massive. Um, we built everything from scratch, except for maybe Oracle. Um, we built our own HTTP servers. We built our own messaging systems. Um, the only thing I don't think we've built is our own routers and our own operating system yet. Um, and I'm not saying that's a good thing either. Um, <clears throat> we have a mix of thousands of stateless processes. Our system was originally a CGI-based application that got to f over four gig. So you can imagine a single runtime executable sitting in Apache that you're forking and dispatching, tearing up and tearing down. That's four gig. That's a massive file. Um, we have over 20 million lines of code to support payments. Um, we decided we were going to break that up and create services. Um, we created services to the fact that we have thousands of individual daemons running between everything now. Every single line of code that was in that 4 gig executable ended up being a single individual daemon that we broke up, and now we're interconnecting them. So we have a massive network of interconnection between things. And you can imagine managing that is pretty painful. Um, it also creates really interesting load balancing or routing issues trying to connect all these individual things together. So if you imagine a front-end application needs to connect to 1,300 individual services, that's going to be pretty painful for connection pooling, SSL resumption, routing, how do I handle security? Um, and then you have to do that both ways. So it ends up with a really, really complex hairball. Um, we have traditional G2E applications. We're migrating from C++ to Java um, for our core systems, as well as a lot of our service tiers. Um, and then payments are generally asynchronous. Everybody thinks they swipe a credit card and it happens right now. Um, it's actually an asynchronous process. Um, so you think about your experience as you're waiting, but in the back end it's actually sending a message off to somebody, coming back around over a period of time, maybe in a different order, maybe to a different destination. Um, a CGI application that is completely blocking isn't built to do that. So not only are we changing our architecture from a synchronous point-to-point -point architecture, but to a message-based architecture that fits our business model. Um, <clears throat> and what our requirements were as part of this transformation was we want something that's highly scalable, partitionable. We don't want one thing to take down anything else in the system. Um, it ha had to be cloud-friendly. Eventually, we want to expand beyond the, perim the perimeter of PayPal. We also want to expand beyond the perimeter of the United States. So we need to be able to break things up into different segments and be able to route between those partitions really well. Um, failure, we can't go down. Um, no single point of failure. So if I take one thing out, it's not going to cause everything else to, to go down. Um, nothing shared. So we don't want anything sharing between anything else. So that means hard drives, that means switches, that means databases, nothing. And then latency, near real time. So if you think of what PayPal is, it's like a stock exchange. You're taking traders and brokers and bringing them together. We're taking customers and merchants and bringing them together. And you expect your payment to happen like that, not in a couple minutes. So <clears throat> that's where we started. And why did we go down to keep it AMQP route? We wanted an open messaging protocol. We knew that we had this proprietary stuff that we we're going to have to plumb together. What we didn't want to do is put ourselves in another proprietary mess. Um, we didn't want to go down the MQ series route where we can only use IBM products or only use JMS. We want the ability to say, hey, we want to go to Node.js and we want to connect that into our service framework. There's no client out there. We want to use Scala, but there's nothing out there from a Scala client for that particular messaging system. AMQP gives us the ability to build new clients 
and new implementations based on the wire protocol and not be bound to a particular vendor. And something we're actually already taking advantage of today um, with our Node.js implementation. Um, Cross-platform interoperability, massive amount of C++ and Java. Um, we looked at other AMQP-based bro brokers like RabbitMQ. Um, VMware wouldn't actually support C++, which is how we ended up on Cupid in particular. Um, we require very low latency, near real time. So the difference between point-to-point -point and a message-based architecture, they almost have to be identical. Um, <clears throat> if not, we're not going to go there. Um, eventual interoperability with ActiveMQ. We have a very, very large ActiveMQ implementation that we use for all our pub-sub topic-based event distributions. So anytime a state changes with an object or anything else, we publish off an event that eventually goes off to another system that we make risk decisions on. Um, we alert customers to possible fraud. We just lock, you lock your account, all kinds of other interesting things that PayPal does for you. Um, so we need to integrate with that actual network as well. And then the ability to influence the community. It's one thing to say that we're going to download this product, but we also want the ability to influence where it's going. We do enough work that we think that we should be able to help guide where things go a little bit. Um, and if we went with an IBM, a non-open source capability set, we weren't going to be able to do that. Um, so that's how we ended up with an AMPP implementation and with Cupid in particular. Questions? Okay. Interrupt if you guys have questions on the fly. I'm not going to wait till the end. So, so where we started? Um, we started out with a very simple implementation. Um, a couple of brokers, we threw a layer, an, L, uh, an F5 layer, layer 5 switch in front of them and we're low balancing. Um, round robin, least min connection rule. Everybody at least got one connection to each individual broker. Every broker had a minimum, minimum one connection. That way, if something went down and things didn't break. Um, it worked, um, but when you try to scale that out to a very large infrastructure, it didn't work, um, and it won't. Um, and it kind of created the same problems we have from a point-to-point -point architecture, dealing with number of connections and everything else. Um, <clears throat> we found that it didn't scale, and it actually, from a performance perspective, it caused us to actually make hops through different things that we didn't need to make a hop through because we were always forcing it to go through that load balancer. So what we ended up doing, if you look, think back to the, the conversation earlier, um, we wanted to change that. So what we found is that we could actually go to about 20 billion messages a day, around 2K average message size, which is a pretty large number. Um, we had variation in message size that introduces latency. So smaller messages were very consistent, the larger the payload went up, the larger the latency on the message. Connections, short-lived processes, CGIs, type processes that tear up and tear down, kill the brokers. Um, so we would have five to 6,000 connections on a broker, it would cause the broker to start flail, um, and latency would start going up. It could handle it, but it wasn't very fast. Um, and then routing concerns. We had a hard time distributing connections. Um, we also had no ability to do NVM memory, uh, NVM messaging. So if you're a typical Java app and you stand up and I'm at JBoss or I got Geronimo and it comes with an instance of Hornet Q or ActiveMQ and you want to write messages to it, there was no way to connect that back to our existing system with that architecture and no way to route back because I threw that load balancer in the middle. So I had no way to actually route back through a load balancer back to my original destination. Um, so it created some really interesting routing problems around how we were connecting things together long term. And we, so we realized that, that that architecture wasn't going to work. Um, so where we went is we decided to create distinct layers of brokers and instances of Cupid. Um, a front-tier set of brokers, a mid-tier set of brokers, and a core set of brokers. And those are really just gateways. They allow us to have a pipe between the different layers themselves. We don't actually put anything on those brokers, per se. All the endpoints actually contain or the endpoint brokers contain all the implementations. So we also partition each layer by function and actor. So we have a function, no, functional area for users, consumers, a functional area for merchants. We don't have one big heterogeneous network, per se. We have individual networks that we then plumb together and then create routes between those networks. Um, we have different networks for business function, risk, payments, account servicing. Um, we have, for system functions, we have the event network that's ActiveMQ. 
we have our services network, which is Cupid, and we have a logging network that right now is um, Tivoli. Um, but we're interconnecting all of those together. And then it's cloud friendly. We need to be able to stare up, tear up, stand up and tear down instances instantaneously based upon capacity. Um, and then we want to isolate partitions within the broker. So what I mean by that is that within Cupid, you have the idea of exchanges. And you have direct exchanges, you have topic exchanges, you have fan out exchanges. We create multiple exchanges for different types of functions. So I'm going to send out a service request. I create an exchange for service requests only. If I'm going to create responses, I create an exchange for service responses only. And the reason why we do that is that way we can scale up or scale down based upon the exchange type, as well as create routes for individual exchanges. And that way I can handle different capacity influxes for those different types of workloads. So from an architectural perspective, instead of having individual clients, each of the consumers is now an AMPP provider. So we have a local broker on every single node that they talk to locally, and then they connect to a mid-tier set of brokers that allow us to essentially act as a gateway to the next tier down below that. And the next time, tier down below that is a set of local brokers on each individual box, um, <clears throat> which gives us a lot of flexibility. We don't have to worry about connections anymore because only that box is connecting to itself, processes, and that box only then connects to the mid-tier. So you have a very small number of connections. Even with thousands of boxes in your data center, each broker only has maybe 1,000 or 2,000 connections on it, but, instead of that 5,000. And since we're partitioning, the worst case scenario that we've seen so far in our data centers with about 10,000 servers is 500 connections per broker, which is much different than we were at before where we were getting six to 7,000 per broker. So the other thing that we found was the interfaces on the old model. <coughs> um, federation semantics is part of what we were doing before because of that routing with the, the switch in front. Uh, we were having to expose out the, the routing characteristics of the message itself saying bind to this exchange, bind to this route, um, go to this broker. And we didn't really want to do that. We wanted the clients to say, you know, just send a message to your local instance and the brokers themselves and that, that network of brokers will figure out where to send it. So we wanted to strip out the whole routing semantics from the client. So they, have to, they don't have to be aware of it. They have to say, I'm going to send it to this queue and they don't need to know which exchange is bound to, what destination is bound to or anything else. And then the brokers and the links in the, between the brokers will actually then handle the routing between everything else. Um, the other thing is we externalize the addressing. Um, we put the addressing actually into Zookeeper. And we pull the addresses out of Zookeeper and then inject them into the applications. And then we start up the brokers. The brokers are just basic containers. And when they start up, they pull their configuration from Zookeeper as well. Um, the other thing is use pure AMQP and JMS wherever possible. Um, we got into some interesting problems with trying to use spring-specific semantics, um, and it caused lots of things to break and not be interoperable. Um, we also ran into some very interesting things when we tried to use um, AMQP-specific semantics based upon the brokers. There's actually differences between the Java implementation of Cupid and the C++ implementation of Cupid, and we got dinged there a couple times. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson, so you're saying uh, the, you were able to use a JMS uh, in the clients, but not Spring JMS. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and it was just really just because Spring expects certain behaviors um, in the JMS implementation, and not all JMS providers are actually implemented the same way. They actually base theirs off of that, their implementation off of ActiveMQ, um, and they make a couple ActiveMQ assumptions in their, in their Spring JMS clients, um, which kind of fall down onto general JMS-based implementations. So. Um, <coughs> The other thing is um, when we looked at the interface and what we were trying to build, it, the layers that we talked about around AMQP and then JCA sitting on top of that and J JMS sitting on top of that gave us a lot of isolation. It allowed us to make decisions based on how we want to interact. So for most clients, they interact at the, JM at the JMS level. They don't interact with anything else. Or they interact with a Spring client or they interact with Camel or whatever component they want to use. They don't know they're actually doing AMQP on the covers. We do have a couple Java-based applications that are actually coding directly to the, the AMQP APIs. Uh, and they're doing that because they want to do things that are very, very specific, um, but those are very isolated. Um, on the security side, we have our own proprietary security mechanisms. So we're not using the default out-of-the-box capabilities that come with, with Cupid. 
we're using our own implementation. We've created SASL components that we plug in to that infrastructure, and then we use those under the covers. So, and the clients don't need to know that, and the broker doesn't know that either. So, cool. Questions? Okay. So, this is actually what we ended up creating. Um, we have a bunch of local instances that then connect down to gateways. Those local instances are also connected out to a set of infrastructure nodes that do logging, inventing, um, statistic gathering. Um, they, they listen for fraud events and some other things that are going on. Um, the gateways then connect down to remote destinations. Um, and in reality, every remote destination is a local destination unto itself. Um, and then we can expand this out horizontally, um, and we can interconnect the gateways between different functional areas, as well as different geographic regions. So think of it, we have a, an implementation in our data center in Salt Lake, we have an implementation in Phoenix. They're connected to gateway level. That's it, that's the only places they're connected. Our connection between Salt Lake City and <clears throat> in Dublin is at the gateway level. And as we can send a message locally to our local broker, it could end up in Dublin. They don't even need to know that we're routing it to Dublin. We look at the message header, it ends up on the exchange, the exchange expects it, inspects it, and then forwards it off. Um, so every client thinks they're writing locally, but in essence, they're writing globally. Questions on this? So we think about federation, and um, the, the Red Hat and Cupid guys brought this up. This is a Cupid implementation. So this is a, this is a layer above AMQP. This is what we've built within Cupid. Under the covers, this is AMQP links that's going on. So we create distinct request and response exchanges, so everything gets separated out, like I said earlier. So we want to be able to isolate performance characteristics as well as routing rules between those, those, those ones, because requests Requests we want to go to a specific destination, responses may vary based upon failures and everything else. So we want to have different kinds of routing algorithms, but depending on how they are. Um, local and remote destinations. So what you see here is actually, this is an actual implementation that I'll run through. Um, you'll see that the, the queue set up here. So you see a direct service gateway, and then you see exchange for direct implementation gateway. So the implementation is where the actual service is consuming messages from. The service gateway is where you're actually binding those two to route them. So clients publish to the service gateway. The implementation consumes from the implementation gateway. So the clients always just write to the service. They don't need to know what the implementation is. And the only thing that needs to know what the implementation is, is the implementation. And he actually creates that gateway, that exchange, and his queue himself when he starts up. So he bootstraps his own initialization to say, I'm a new service, whether it's a user read or a lifecycle service, when he starts up, he creates his own queue, he creates his own gateway, and then he federates himself into the gateway, sorry, creates his own exchange, and then he federates himself into the network. And as soon as he does it, then anybody can start routing messages to him. So there is no configuration that we're pre-populating out for service implementations, only for clients. What's that? Oh, can you bring the mic? Oh, sorry. Um, request queues, we use queue routes. So we want to load balance. So we want to make sure that we can distribute messages across the network. So between the local and the gateways, we have queue routes. We publish to the local, and then it will actually load balance out the number of messages to the individual gateway destinations. The implementations have queue routes from the gateways to the implementations, and then they load balance out to the next level. So you're essentially creating this large tree that distributes the messages out to individual implementations, which gives us a massive amount of scalability. Um, it also allows us, instead of load balancing connections, we're actually load balancing messages. So the faster the consumer is, the faster they're going to pull, pull messages. So we're not actually going to unfairly distribute load, which is something we had in our point-to-point -point model. We would route messages to a service implementation that was completely underwater, but could handle another connection and you would get really, really bad response time. And now we can say the variability between a good response and a bad response is much lower now because they're pulling when they have capacity instead of us pushing traffic to them. Um, responses use dynamic routes. And this is something we were actually talking about a little bit out offline. Um, we do this to prevent failures. So when we create a response destination, say JMS request reply, we create one for each 
container, not for each session. So that when we connect to a broker and say, here's my destination, if that broker fails and we reconnect to another broker, we want that destination to still be valid. If I use the session identifier, it would no longer be valid. I'd get a new session because I'm reconnecting. By using a unique destination for each VM or spring context, as brokers fail, because we have that dynamic route, it will actually route the message to wherever that client reconnects to. And the only messages that we ever lose are when a message is in memory on a broker during a failure. And we can get around the persistence if we really want to, but everything's out in potent, so we don't really worry about that so much. Um, <clears throat> but it gives us the ability to essentially, we can take brokers out of service and not really impact anybody at that point in time. So it's kind of self-annealing around the architecture. Um, <clears throat> And then responses use unique binding addresses for routing. That's kind of what I talked about. So the routing key, the, bind, the binding key for each response queue is unique to that VM or that spring context. So I'll actually walk through an example and I'll show you the code. This is a small subset of what our system actually looks like. Granted, all the PayPal stuff is stripped out of it, but you can actually see load balancing the messages and the routing and how everything goes down. So we'll start by creating the whole network, and this is essentially what we do at Bootstrap for each service, for each client. And then we'll publish messages to the gateway, and it will load balance between the two destinations. And then I'll publish to one of the destinations, and it will load balance between himself and the other destination. Cool. Maybe. So I'll start with the, the basic script. It's not good. <laughs> Is it the curse of a... Uh... <coughs> Sorry. I'll do it on this side then. So this is, this is our source code. So if you walk through this, we, tear it, we create a couple data directories, we store process data. We create a couple of daemons that are out there, 53, uh, 5673, which is the gateway, 5674, and 5675, which are the remote instances. From there, we actually, though, could then create links between all these brokers. And then from the links, we would create the queues. So like I said, we create a local queue that they would write to that they don't even know it's remote. And then we create an implementation queue which is actually remote to that broker. And every broker gets a copy of those. <clears throat> and then we create a set of exchanges. And those exchanges are, there's a gateway exchange and there's an implementation exchange. Clients write to the gateway exchange, services consumed from the implementation exchange. And then from there, we bind the queues to the, um, to the exchanges. And then we create the routes between them. So we create a queue route between each one of these that will end up load balancing connections. And then we throw off a bunch of messages to each one. So <coughs> questions on this? Anybody seen this before? It takes a little bit of time to stand up. So.
there any way you guys can make this faster, by the way? <laughs> Are you running pre-18? Yeah. Yeah, actually, a lot of that stuff got a lot faster. Now you tell me. I, I blame it on the fact that I'm using yours. It's the network. It's the network? No, it's all local. Okay. So we're going to start spouting some messages off. Ah, oh, son of a... What the heck? Well, that's going to suck. Figures. Let me... Uh, I'm not going to run through this all again. Okay. So I just threw out a thousand messages out to the brokers, and now you're going to see that on 5673, which is the gateway, that it got a thousand messages, and then on fifty-six seventy-four, one got three fifty-nine and one got six forty-one. So we load balance the messages between those two individual instances. And there's the reason that there's a little bit different is the processes are running off of them. One's a faster process versus the other one. So, <clears throat> and then we're going to reroute them the other way. So I'm going to publish to fifty-six seventy-four, and it's going to route all the way back up to fifty-six seventy-three, then reload balance back out to back to themselves. So we published 600 messages on this one, one got 241, and the other one got 359. Cool. So this basic pattern is what we build our whole network on. So you can actually go up to thousands and thousands of individual brokers, or if you're on the Proton side of things, individual just AMPP listeners and scale them out via building a set of routes like this. Yeah, you don't need to drain them. So that's our basic architecture at PayPal. So the other thing that's, that we noticed in our initial implementation here is that message size is important. Um, pay a lot of attention to message size. Don't send them any more data than you really have to because it actually drastically affects latency. And we're very, very latency sensitive. Um, the other thing is, keep, if you can, keep your messages lower than your frame size on the network. As much as we can say that they are full duplex and multiplex connections and you know, they can interweave the messages between them, on latency sentences of applications, that's not a good thing. Um, you really want to fit every message into a single network packet and move on. Um, interleaving causes pausing, believe it or not, so you, it's not going to be as fast. Um, avoid default reply to on implementation, implementations. Um, we don't use the JMS reply to so that most people would normally do. Um, and the reason for that is it's really, really slow. Um, and for us, really, really slow is two milliseconds. So. Every time that you create a, a reply to destination in JMS, it's about two milliseconds, sometimes even longer, depending if there's SSL, depending on how the configuration is set up. Um, we actually create a reply to for every JVM, and then we use futures to dispatch messages back to the individual threads that are actually <coughs> waiting for the response versus letting it happen on the broker and creating thousands of individual reply to destinations. Um, it's a much more efficient from a connections perspective, but also from a performance perspective, we avoid that, that latency hit to create that reply to. So, um, <clears throat> and the other thing is um, pull configurations versus prepackaging. We started out um, by prepackaging everything, and we ended up with pulling everything in and initializing and bootstrapping when the brokers and the JVM start up. So, um, <clears throat> so 
this is how we actually manage our config. Like I said, we started out with um, a configuration where we put everything into a properties file, we bundle that up into our RPMs, we push the RPMs out with Puppet, and distribute it out to all 10,000 servers. Um, and anytime we wanted to make a change, it was pushing that all out to 10,000 servers. Um, what we do now is we have a basic config that we push out to Zookeeper. Um, and then each of the individual Cupid instances is wrapped with a Python script that looks for events coming from Zookeeper and says, ah, oh, the config has changed. Update Cupid and apply that out there. And we use that for ACLs. We use that for creating queues and direct links and everything else. Um, and then that way, the only thing that we're pushing out to each server is a basic bootstrap that says, here's where Zookeeper's at. Go start yourself up. Versus it having to be aware of the whole network of brokers and any changes that we made to it. So. Sorry, the, the Cupid instances are uh, holding for the, the updates? The Cupid instances themselves aren't. Um, they're, if you look at what Zookeeper has, Zookeeper essentially says um, there is a event listener within Zookeeper that will get a notification from Zookeeper anytime a particular node of the tree is of interest. So if you say that I'm interested in the services config, it will notify its listener that a change has happened and then you get the change that's happened as a result of that. Um, that's part of the basic configuration uh, paradigm of Zookeeper. So what we've done is we've taken Zookeeper and we've taken Cupid and said, okay, we start our Cupid instance up. By the way, we also have a Zookeeper listener that's just a Python script that says anytime there's a change that relates to these Cupid instances, pull those changes down and apply them to Cupid so that we're not distributing out all these changes. We can update them in one central location and then they federate out with relative consistency across the whole network. Zookeeper is telling all the Cupid nodes to go do that. So um, it's a pretty common um, implementation. I think uh, we do that. Um, LinkedIn does that as well. Um, there's a couple of other folks that are out there doing the same kind of configuration. So. Um, monitoring, um, putting something in production that actually moves a lot of money. We have to pay attention to what's going on. Um, so the Cupid management framework is actually pretty cool. Um, each object in the broker is manageable and it publishes events and statistics about itself. The question is, is figuring out what they are and what you can subscribe to. Um, but once you figure that out, it's actually pretty easy. And then you can actually subscribe to things and reroute the events to somewhere else. Um, so in one of our implementations, we take events and we route them over our Tivoli Rendezvous network to eBay's um, knock. So they're curious about certain kind of events. And so we have a cow logging infrastructure that says, oh, this kind of event, route this from Cupid to Tivoli. Sorry, not typically, but Tipco, and send it off. Um, we can describe interested events, so you can listen for particular things um, within the broker itself. Um, <clears throat> and then, we, like I said, we can dispatch out to the SNMP traps, SNMP traps, Nagios to the NOC, um, internal logging, et cetera. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like as well. Um, so what can you monitor? Um, here's the things that we monitor. Um, there might be more. Maybe the, the Red Hat guys can tell us. Um, but agents, bindings, so anytime somebody binds to a particular topic or binds to a particular exchange. Um, connections, so somebody creates a connection, you can listen for any connection and say, oh, new client connected to my network. I'm concerned about that. Um, any modifications to exchanges or statistics on that. Um, links between brokers or from clients to brokers. Um, queues, which is the most common thing that people look at. Subscriptions, the systems and the vhosts. Through the QMF framework, we actually created a complete map of our whole broker infrastructure, and we only do that by discovering one initial broker. And from that broker, we discover the links to the next broker, and links to the next broker, and links to the next broker, and links to the next broker. And, the next broker. and we can actually we build a whole grid of saying, here's everything that we have out there, and then we can actually then go through the QMF framework and say, here's what's performing in each one. And then we can essentially do auto discovery through all the links through QMF. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but generally, we listen for mainly just events, new objects, um, and statistics. You know, queue thresholds, how many NQ, DQs, what's the latency for a particular message type? Um, those kinds of things is what we're listening for. Um, and we do all, all that with a basic set of Python scripts. So, and I will show you those if my system's up and running again.
So I'll show you a very example, a very simple um, monitoring script. So. so here's a basic monitoring script that we use. Um, I'll kind of go through it a bit. Um, <clears throat> This is actually taken directly from the Cupid site, at least the initial part of it is. And then we've extended that basic script to do some other things. But essentially within the script, you register for interest into a, into a particular broker, and then you look for different objects. And those different objects come in the form of a record. You take that record, and then we've, we actually fire that off to an event handler that is based on a configuration. And then that configuration says, I'm interested in this event or not this event. Um, within the event handler, this is for queues, here's all the different attributes that we look for. So we say we handle an event, and if that object is in the configuration, it'll fire out things for total message dequeues, message total in queues, whatever attribute that we're interested in changing, we can actually inspect that event and take action on it, whether it's an SNP trap, or whether it's maybe restarting a broker, or actually adding capacity based upon the performance of the individual broker or the events that are coming across in that. Um, and our simple config, I'll show you. We use a really simple config file to do this. Um, so each section is a different um, <clears throat> object in the broker. So we have a transaction test, which is an object in the broker. Um, it's actually a queue. And then we're interested in the individual message and queues. Um, there's a threshold that's set, whether I want to send it out to an SMP trap, to our centralized logging trap, or I want to send it out to a log file. Uh, and you can do that for any kind of object, how we've set this up. And then to run it, So you can see, as it went through, there's all the things I don't really care about that published out. And then the one thing on transaction test, I'm actually monitoring that one, and it's looking for individual events on that. So just via basic Python script, we can inspect anything within the broker and then take action upon it anywhere in our network. And then using the same, monitoring, the same scripting capabilities, we actually discover our whole network through just inspecting one broker and then going out to individual ones. Questions? You guys are quiet. So, <clears throat> performance. Um, I figured the active MQ guy put up performance numbers, so I should as well. Um, so, these, these are our round trip times. Um, these are actually live numbers for us. Uh, the top graph shows just basic on the wire, no PayPal specific stuff on it, what we measure on our Cupid infrastructure. Um, and each, the top line is bytes, so number of bytes. Um, so over our <coughs> one gig network, um, we're looking at for a 1K message about 0.66 milliseconds. Um, for multi-nodes, which means I'm hopping between multiple machines, um, we're looking at about 0.98 milliseconds round trip. So this is from the client to the broker to the service implementation back to the broker, back to the client. Um, and then over RDMA, we're looking about 0.44 milliseconds. And we use RDMA for our back-end payment systems, things we actually care about. And then the, the second graph is adding our stuff into it um, and our different behavioral use cases that we run through. So that's serialization, SSL, um, message signing, all the other things that we do um, on top of it. And you'll notice the numbers go up quite a bit. Um, but they're still relatively quick. Questions? Look concerned back there. No concern? No concern. Okay. Um, so how can we use it? Um, 
So we're actually using the NQP stuff in our cloud environment. Uh, so what we're doing is we're developing cartridges. So within OpenShift, there's a notion of cartridges. So we have a JBoss cartridge. Now we're developing a, um, a AMQP Cupid cartridge. And that Cupid cartridge developers pull in. When it starts up, it pulls itself and registers itself into the network. And it starts listening. Um, within the OpenStack infrastructure that we use in production, we listen for those queue events coming in and the latencies. And we say, oh, for this kind of queue, we need more capacity. And it will actually go off and stand up a whole other implementation, an instance, because our queue depth went up too high. Um, if the latency gets too low, we stand up additional service implementations to address the latency issues, or we send off alerts as a result of that. So we actually build a dynam dynamically scaling infrastructure based upon monitoring of our AMQP infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> Some possible applications that we're looking at right now, um, mobile um, via JavaScript. So we're, we're actually developing mobile interfaces um, right now on Node.js with um, <clears throat> Backbone.js connecting into on the client um, JavaScript application. So you have JavaScript, JavaScript in the browser connecting back to Node.js over Backbone.js connecting to AMQP as a messaging infrastructure under the covers. Um, right now we're wrapping um, the native C++ libraries with JavaScript using V8. So we're exposing everything out with V8 prototypes and then the JavaScript Node.js interacts directly with it. Um, we're hoping to get a native implementation so we can embed it in the browsers. Um, payment devices, if anybody goes to Home Depot, you know, swipe your car, wants to use PayPal. Um, right now we're using HTTP. We're thinking about swapping that over to MQP. Um, so I think uh, American Eagle, Abercrombie Fitch, Home Depot, those kind of places. Um, <clears throat> where we're looking to actually use it some more, um, linking AMQP directly between our Keep It implementation and our active, M active MQ implementation. And that's just a timing thing based upon the versions that we're on. Um, but we want to build a heterogeneous fabric so we can distribute one set of clients out to everybody and we can choose based upon quality of service and where they need to go to which messaging infrastructure they're connecting into, or whether they're just a messaging provider themselves. Um, we're looking at embedded messaging engines into different devices, um, you know, taxi magics, et cetera. So a lot of the, the things you guys are seeing in startups, we're trying to get PayPal into those things, um, and we're thinking APP will be a way for us to do that, to bridge back into our network. The, the first entry is basically you're, you're trying to uh, link your, your new uh, messaging infrastructure with your legacy one. Exactly. Yep. It had performance issues. It didn't necessarily have performance issues. Um, so <clears throat> maybe I should clarify that one. Um, and I'll get into the, the weeds a little bit on PayPal's history. Uh, we actually have seven messaging systems. Um, of those seven, one is Tibco uh, that we acquired from eBay that we use for alerts to the knock. Um, we have two versions of ActiveMQ, um, both of which are forked, um, that aren't the same as everybody else's. Uh, don't ask. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have three proprietary systems that we wrote ourselves. Um, we're merging all those into ActiveMQ. So ActiveMQ is our main messaging platform for the bulk of what we do. Um, we don't use it for our low latency request reply payment processing type stuff, and we don't intend to. Um, the performance differences between the two is significant enough that we care about that. Um, and they're, they're microseconds differences. Um, they're not huge differences. Um, but you add that up to our volumes, it gets significant. Um, so we don't really have performance problems with ActiveMQ. Um, they're like this. I mean, so um, I wouldn't brand it that way. Um, <clears throat> it's really about placing our proprietary stuff and choosing the quality service based upon the things that we're trying to do. Um, so, um, the other thing we're looking at is, did that answer your question? So, it's, it, when you say it, it's, it, the active MQ latency is good, it's just not good enough. Yeah, I mean, we're talking the difference, like, um, so if you go to the, the one side of house, like, we're at 0.66 milliseconds, active MQ is at 0.98. I, it, it's, you know, 320 microseconds to most people, that's, you know, inconsequential. When you're doing 60% of the total financial transactions on the internet, that's a big deal. Uh, that adds up quite a bit. So um, we're splitting hairs, but um, <clears throat> most people would never notice. Um, the other thing, replacing some of our proprietary service framework with Proton. Uh, we wrote our own HTTP server and our own web service framework. 
Um, we think there's an opportunity to, to get rid of that and replace that, um, which is our native AMQP interface. Um, the other thing is replacing the Cupid libraries with you know, Proton specific libraries in the Messenger, Messenger API versus the out of the box one that came with Cupid. Um, and the reason for that is just for some generic interfaces, but and not binding us directly to how Red Hat packages things. So, sorry guys. Um, but, <coughs> but that's it. So, questions? I'll let you guys go early then. Go get a beer. Yeah. Okay.